Hello, today is Monday, August 9th. Pretty sure it's going to be another 100 degree plus day here in Austin, Texas. Hot time. I've been writing an article on how to choose a counselor, which will be posted up on my website soon. And I thought I'd share with you today a few thoughts on this subject. I wrote quite a bit about looking at the structure of the mental health system and the need to kind of take that into account when you're choosing a counselor. I'm not going to go over that so much just now. That's in my videos over and over and over again. You know, the structure of coercion, the structure of involuntary commitment, the structure of biopsychiatry, those kind of things. Bottom line, what's very, very important to know is that as I said, as I laid out in the book review I did of what Robert Whitaker's Anatomy of an Epidemic, you know, is that in today's climate, the tendency is to go for the idea that there's a biologically or genetically based defect that requires psychiatric drugs and to prescribe and to get on them. And it's important to know the bottom line that they tend not to work, they tend to cause a lot, a lot of problems, and you tend to have a lot less likelihood of really getting your life back and doing well if you're on the drugs. That's the short part. The other part is that as a client, you need to know whether a counselor is going to support an adventure of personal growth and self-discovery, right? Or interpret your life challenges and distress as mental illness, needing psych drugs. And if someone's oriented towards that belief system and that view, especially when the going gets tough, the tough get going, as the saying goes. In other words, then they send you to a psychiatrist, so then they say, go consult with your doctor. Maybe you need a drug. That is a problem. And it tends to happen, especially where fear is present. And guess what? Fear is always a component of growth and transformation. So you transform that into this idea of disease and go on drugs, it suppresses the whole process and leads to this problematic direction. I'm going to start with an inspiring stanza from a poem by Uriah Mountain Dreamer, or Uriah Mountain Dreamer, it's called The Invitation. It's a reference point for choosing a relationship, right? And that would include a counseling relationship, right? Here it is. It doesn't interest me who you know or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. Isn't that great? Will you stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back? She's talking about any kind of close, intimate relationship. Here I'm talking about a counseling relationship. You want a counselor who can sit in the fire and not shrink back and not get afraid and not fall back on the idea that you're mentally ill and need drugs. Okay? Number one, has the counselor done their own work? That's the main thing above all. You don't want talking heads. You don't want uh, fearful people who haven't addressed their own fear controlling people who haven't been able to let go. You want to take note, are they at ease? Are they confident and relaxed? Are they trustworthy? Have they done their own personal work? And are they doing it? It's way more important than any credential, believe me. I think it's also very important to consider whether they have a perspective on a good life. Because if they don't, they're going to tend to th think that it's all about uh, your personal problems and that counseling is the most important thing, and that if you've got problems and challenges in the world, it's because of you and your distress. They're going to think, they're going to overrate counseling. They're not going to put it in perspective. Counseling is pretty simple. It's basically talking and listening. It's basically a counselor kind of standing guard, providing encouragement and support to go in and through your distress. It's not really that complicated, right? Professional counselors stand in where the community has failed, right? But it's not that different 
from what we naturally do with friends and family, talking and listening. If you don't have a perspective on a good life, you're going to tend to blame and pathologize. You know, you're going to lose track on taking on life, you know? What does that mean? It means authentic self-care and relationships, the journey of self-discovery, deep, rewarding relationships, meaningful study and purposeful work, creative expression. These aren't really counseling issues. And what you don't want to do is to use counseling as an avoidance of gradually taking on a big life. You can use counseling to support that, but all the counseling in the world won't replace deep relationships, meaningful study, and purposeful work. That's a perspective that's very important. You know, somebody like me who sits and talks to people all day is not really the inspiring role model. It's someone like Scott and Helen Nearing or other people who really take on a meaningful, purposeful, challenging life. One more thing on the perspective on counseling. Barry Duncan and Scott Miller wrote a book called The Heroic Client. I've gone over this data before. Real quickly, 40% of the outcomes in, in counseling research and psychotherapy research are called extra therapeutic factors, meaning the things that happen outside of the counseling relationship. That's the single biggest factor of success in counseling is what happens outside counseling. Let's get humble about this, right? Get a job, find something inspiring, meet a new person, right? 30% is the quality of the relationship. Doesn't matter what technique or method or whatever, it's the quality of the relationship. Is it supportive? Is it trustworthy? Is it empowering, right? So that's 70% right there. 15% more is so-called placebo or expectancy effect. And then you bring in this other little 15% that has to do with method and technique. It can make a difference, but let's put it in perspective, right? Hmm. All right, I want to just focus some on the nitty gritty here, okay? The actual doing it. Self-education is important. There's no shortcut for investigative study and hard work period. After that, word of mouth. Just like other things, you know, word of mouth is the best way to find a good counselor who other people like, right? If that's not available, then taking some time and energy to build trustworthy allies is well worth the effort, right? Beyond that, it's a good idea to ask a few preliminary questions. This can be done over the phone. A lot of counselors offer a 20, 30 minute free interview to talk to them. There's no right or wrong way to do this, but here's a few thoughts about it. What are your basic policies and fees? You know, where do you meet? How long are your sessions? What do you charge? Any, any flexibility on those, right? Basic policy questions. What are your guiding principles? Where do you stand, right? What's your view about counseling? You know, ask those questions. How do you see counseling and personal growth and transformation? How do you understand it? I understand it as a natural and equitable process of self-discovery and growth, that it's a natural built-in kind of urge for healing and wholeness. A counselor's job is to support that, not to force it, make it happen, have an agenda for it, right? What is your training? You can ask that. You know, what are your personal theories, counseling theories? What are your guiding theories? Remember that theories and techniques are really not nearly as important as who the person is but it's useful to know and make sure they're compatible with what you like and what you think, right? 
I like reevaluation counseling, just grassroots kind of idea that there's a natural process of expression that helps with healing and recovery and freeing up expression and thought. Right? I like process work of Arnie Mendel's. I like some certain experiential dynamic kind of approaches. All these have in common the idea of trusting and allowing the unfolding of a person's process, not my agenda. Right? What kind of personal work have you done? What kind of work are you doing now? Maybe that should go first, but that's very, very important. Right? What do you think about biological psychiatry, about psychiatric drugs, about drug withdrawal? Obviously, if you're going through drug withdrawal, you know, you want to make sure you have somebody who supports that, is not afraid of it, and knows that that can happen. But in general, you want someone who's not going to readily fall back when it gets tough or when they get a little bit afraid. As soon as you're a little depressed or a little anxious or a lot anxious or a lot depressed, or for God's sake, talk about suicide, they're going to immediately run to psychiatry. Huh? Speaking of suicide, that's the main reason for coercion. Oh, I have to call the authorities now. Do you have someone who's going to be able to listen to you talk about your despair and go into those feelings without deciding that that's then their duty to coerce you into a lockup and force drugging? Might be something to gently clarify. That's a tricky subject. It goes deep, you know. You don't want to try to make an individual responsible for your position, you know. You don't want to be calling somebody and say, oh, I'm suicidal, I'm on a bridge right now, you know, and expect them, you know, not to just call 911 as a human being, you know. you got to take some responsibility there. But to be able to talk about, you know, I feel suicidal, I feel despair, I feel like giving up, and let the person allow you to do that. Because otherwise, the processes the conditions necessary for transformation are aborted, which is called acceptance, which is called safety, which is called trust, which is called expression of your deepest thoughts and feelings. It needs to be safe and supportive and allowed to do that. What are your privacy policies? That's related to what I just said. Anything, anything else that you want to know that's significant for you. It is not safe for you to bring up whatever without judgment or defensiveness, then that's probably not a good counselor for you. Here's what I recommend on beginning counseling. Once a decision is made to have an initial session, go for it, right? Go for that session once you've decided. Try it, you know. Many times a client actually only wants or needs one session and that's it, and that's okay. If there's a need and desire for more, if it feels right, and the counselor seems like someone you can trust and work with, I recommend you go ahead and commit to three or four sessions. It's not a lifelong commitment. At that point, you have more information, more experience. You can evaluate, is this working for me? Is this going the direction that I want it to go? Is this person trustworthy? Am I getting value from that? If not, sayonara. If you are, you can go from there. That's practical stuff. Main thing, you're the boss, you're the boss, you're the boss. And you deserve to have a counselor who supports and trusts and is relaxed with your process and is willing to be there and be authentic when you challenge them, or when y'all get hung up together, which you'll do. And who doesn't just force things on you, but ask permission if they have a suggestion or a direction that they think might be helpful in confronting your distress. It's a relationship. And relationships bring stuff up, right? So there's a few thoughts. I'll have the article posted on my website soon. Thanks, have a good day. If you liked this video, we have hundreds of more alternative videos ranging from sexual health to psychology 
to mind control. So if you liked it, go ahead and click on me to enter the Psyche Truth channel.